unions, labor unions yesterday and especially today. What power during a union? I don't know. A lot of people don't seem to care about unions because they have a declining membership overall. But let's talk about some of the things they actually do for you. If you're a member of a union and you feel your boss is treating you poorly or management as a whole, they can file a thing called a grievance, which means they're saying this portion of the collective bargaining agreement was violated by management and we want it resolved. Your union can go to bat for you. A, a person called a shop steward, which is an elected official in the union, can sit down and they can file a grievance for you on your behalf or on behalf of a large group of employees. Uh, unions, they typically have a president, a vice president, a shop steward, maybe a couple other officers, but really, you would think the president is the most powerful person in but the one that really goes to bat for the employees, the ones represented by the union, is the shop steward. It's a very powerful position because it's their job to sit down there and intervene and help the employee be successful to enforce their position against management or try to sit down and come to a compromise in a process. Typically, they're elected, something happens, you normally have an informal step where the employee talks to the supervisor, hey, this is what I feel being picked on over here, and you have this informal, and they have a dialogue going on, hopefully without a labor rep, but sometimes they do. If they don't work that out, then they can sit down the employee and then file a formal written grievance, which is step two usually, and they go through and they talk it out on a formal basis, and then sometimes there's a step three, and the step three doesn't work, then often number four is actually going to arbitration, which means you bring in a third outside party by the time it's done. Sometimes step four is a higher level in the organization, depends how big it is. But for the most part, the union can go outside the organization to get a problem resolved using an arbitrator in the process. So there's a grievance process. Usually it's negotiated and it's right in the contract that defines exactly what happens at each step of the way you go through. So mediation and arbitration, they're two different things. Make certain you differentiate between the two of them. Mediation is very common. It's using the, the, the third party and they have no true power other than coercion in the aspect of do this, they can do this, they can do this. So it's all a matter of negotiations, but they cannot impose a decision on, on the parties. It's pretty common to bring a mediator in, they're an outside party, they go from room to room, One, the union's over here, the management's over here, they go visit the union, okay, management says this over here, and, and if they win, you're in big trouble. They turn around and they go back to management and says, the union says this over here, and if they win, you're in big trouble, and they go back and forth, and they try to browbeat both sides. They're actually relatively effective a lot of times because sometimes you get so caught up in the emotional turmoil of having these dialogues, you forget about the fact that you might lose because you're so caught up by the emotional issues. Mediators, a lot of times, are relatively effective. And if that doesn't work, you can go to arbitration. An arbitrator can sit down and hear both sides. They don't have to sit down and encourage both sides. They can say, hey, this is how it's going to be. You both abide by it. It's called binding arbitration. And you have to sit down and abide by the ruling of the binding arbitrator. Sometimes there's a panel where they issue a binding decision in a labor dispute, and both sides have to abide by that. So that being said, a mediator is voluntary, and they encourage. An arbitrator listens, they're impartial, and they render a binding decision in the labor dispute. Occasionally, there's a clause where it's not binding, but, but, but arbitration is generally a binding decision. If the union is at the, at the negotiating table, maybe at, usually not in agreements, but in the contract negotiation where they're addressing wages, hours, or working conditions, or some other part of the contract, union doesn't like it, they can say, hey, we're taking our labor, we're going to go outside, and we're going to just walk around and carry a picket sign and say, you, we don't like you, you're a bad person. And by the way, they do, okay? So they might wear shirts that have your picture on them. You could be famous. Just think of the opportunity. Yes, yes, you can have that as a strike. They can even do a boycott, which seems to me to be kind of a really bad strategy. Boycott this company. Well, you work for that company. If too many people listen to you, the company goes belly up and you lose your job anyway. Okay, so, but that's a tool they have. They can strike, they can do a boycott. They can even do a secondary boycott by encouraging people that buy their stuff also to sit or stop buying the product. I think boycotting is a really bad strategy. Strike works to some extent, but a lot of times you can't strike in the public sector as you go through. Management has tools of its own. They can just lock the door and say, hey, 
We don't want to put up with your stuff. We're going to keep you out. You can't come into work, and we're not going to pay you at all. The union does their, their eyes get big, say, you can't do that. We just did. See that door? Click, and the door is locked. Okay, they can also get an injunction to do something to refrain them from striking. And sometimes that happens in some of the public sector because they're doing vital things that affect society as a whole. Or they can hire a thing called a strike breaker. And there's a whole series of negative terminology they use when they come in, but they literally walk across the union picket line and they do the work of the people on strike. A lot of times the people on strike, they don't like it, they say, bad things about them. They might even do things. They might toss nails down in front of the tires of the cars, get flat tires. They, they may hit them with signs for all you know in the process, but things happen. Strike breakers are really difficult because of the fact that they're doing the work of the people that are on strike. And sometimes the union loses and they just get, they, they just get rid of the union and they sometimes win the aspect of what's going on the process over here. Here's a, walking a fine line, an example of it. You're, you're hungry, you don't have much money, and somebody is on strike. Do you go in? Do you cross the picket line? Are you one of those evil people stealing work from those people out there? They're making $35 an hour, and you just hope they get 14 as a, as, as a strike breaker. Oh, the 14 is good. Oh, yeah, because you need to eat. And those people, they're striking. Do you do it? Do you apply? What are the consequences? And is your choice ethical? Certainly it's legal, but is it ethical? You know, those are issues that sit down there and, and come from the inside as to our perception as to what is right and what's wrong. It really is an ethical choice and the law is not gonna intervene for you this time. Sometimes it does by saying these are right and these are wrong, but in this case, it's an ethical decision driven by you. The football players, boy, they had a lockout and, and those football players, oh, they were starving to death. They were only getting paid a mere $300,000 a year. Oh my gosh, what an awful thing. How could they really get by on a mere $300,000 a year? Oh, oh, now there's some players making $300,000 a game. Wow, that's really rough to get by on that kind of money. By the way, there's a term called facetious. And if you think I'm sincere for one second, you really don't know what I'm talking about. Good night. You got these union members that play professional sports and they want us to feel sorry for them that they're going on strike because those millionaires up there are really picking on us. In the meantime, you're a millionaire too, making an awful lot of money that I'm paying for my tickets. And by the way, the last time I had a nosebleed ticket up in the bleachers, I had to pay $74 for the, for the ticket on top of that. So, oh my gosh, I don't feel sorry for you. But yes, I do. I'm sorry. I feel sorry for those poor players. That being said, a lot of tactics they go through. Unions, they, they include a lot more white collar people and they really have a large different coverage. You'll see them in the healthcare industry. You'll also see them in some information technology. There's a lot of positive and a lot of negative. You'll see the aspects of here, the percentages as to where the union pockets are in the United States. And it really changes from state to state by the time you go through. So union membership has been on a decline the tools for, for unions are strikes and boycotts and work slowdowns. A work slowdowns when you work according to just exactly what the contract says, don't do anything extra. Management tools for negotiating include lockouts, strike breakers, and injunctions. Union labors yesterday and today. Take care.